Uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, let's, the title of my talk, which, which uh, is uh, Developing International Collaboration Based on Complementarity, it's because uh, in research, uh, a number of years ago, I, I developed a solution to get engineering and manufacturing collaborating and discovered through this large industrial implementations that complementarity in the data structure was something interesting. And that's how I got interested on the reality of complementarity. And uh, later, uh, as you will see, I'm from Canada. And uh, I, before I came to Moscow, I was in developing some collaborations in between universities and companies and and therefore I also met this uh, phenomenal uh, approach and I said well maybe there's something that we can do and I will try to show you uh, the example of Skoltech through these eyes and uh, to so that you can maybe find for your own university uh, ways which uh, lead to very, very productive collaborations. If you look at it, there is very, very strong uh, business sector research that indicates that acquisition and strategic alliances uh, that are based on complementarity of resources are more productive than those based on similarity. And when we do uh, collaborations, we have, of course, the first step is to go into similarity, find people that are like us or similar to us and go from there. Now, there is a paper that was written in 2001 in the Journal of Management, which I found, which kind of fed my interest towards developing collaborations through this approach. And this paper by Harrison, Hitt, and, and Hoskinson in Ireland, it says that resource complementarity and business combination, it's extending the logic to organizational alliances. Well, maybe it can apply to universities, maybe. And therefore, this is what I'm gonna try to, to show you. And this is a 2001 paper, but it was already based on the 1991 paper. So they, what they did, they did an extensive survey of strategic alliances and collaboration in, in, in the commercial sector and found some that the collaboration based on complementarity rather than similarity gave better results. So, and I'm quoting them there, the valuable, unique, and inimitable synergy. Of course, here you're talking about synergy that can be realized by integrating complementary resources, provide an opportunity for the firm. And now the question, can we translate this to the academic world to create competitive advantages that can be sustainable for a period of time? And the last part, which is interesting also, is that in addition, complementary resources present opportunities for enhanced learning, as well as the development of new capabilities. Well, I think that this is what we're trying to do when we are looking for collaboration in universities. Recently, in 2018, there's also this, uh, in the Journal of International Management, Local and Global Knowledge Complementarity, R&D collaboration, innovation in foreign and domestic firms. This one goes further because it's, it's looking at the links between companies and universities. And if you look at this quote there by Un and Rodriguez uh, from 2018, very, very recently. So it says that in contrast, domestic firms, so that means that companies or units that are in close contact with some universities locally can have a great impact on collaboration at the international level. And the reason I'm talking about this, it's because of this. Because before I came to Moscow and worked for Skoltech, at the invitation of Ed Crowley, the founding president of uh, Skoltech, who's from MIT, uh, the, uh, I was leading a very large uh, 
consortium or framework in Canada, an aerospace on an open innovation forum, open innovation format. And if you look in the middle there, you'll have the universities all there, large and small, and, and government labs. And here you have the companies, the large major companies in Canada and aerospace, but also some international partners and associate members which are funding agencies and that. But you can see that this is, was my experience. I led this uh, very uh, interesting uh, initiative called CREAC, Consortium for Research and Innovation in Aerospace in Quebec, which, which had link all across Canada from the Pacific Ocean to the Atlantic. And then I learned through that endeavor that university collaborations and company collaborations are very, very, can be very, very productive. So let's, based on that, I arrived in Skultech in 2014. Skultech is a very recent university. Uh, it, will be, it will be eight years next week. Okay, eight. So in phase one, there was a very intense collaboration at the foundation there with MIT. And at the, in the first phase, this uh, collaboration was uh, on all fronts. Recruitment of faculty, development of programs, starting courses, policies, campus, everything. Because uh, Skultech is started from scratch. Uh, in 2011. In October 2011, Ed Crowley arrived in Moscow with his laptop and that was it. Of course, some funding, but uh, and MIT behind. Now, in the phase one, therefore, there was establishment of credibility and attra attract exceptional talent was one of the key elements of this. Now, we're more today in the phase two, we're and right from the beginning, we also developed a collaboration with the University of Calgary in Canada. And I will mention that later, give you a little more of an example on this. And now we expand the basis. Mind you, the, uh, even though the generate and transfer knowledge was very, very important from the beginning, the idea of collaboration, international collaboration was strong from the beginning. And now in the phase two, here, MIT was involved in all phases. In the second phase, uh, we developed 19 collaborative research projects with them and some, but less on, orga organ on the organization front and more on the research side. And now as we're getting to phase three and we're starting a, a strategic collaboration with TUM, we extend, okay, on more North America and Europe and Pacific, Asia Pacific, and then we're looking at some more selective partnerships there. So that was the beginning less than eight years ago. If you look at the current partnerships, it's huge. Uh, we have a number, of course, MIT in red there, but we have a number of partnerships across Europe. And some of them are MOUs, but these, we have more MOUs than this. These are partnerships where there are some students or faculty exchange and papers, current publications uh, in place. Okay. Some are rather small, some are very important. Of course, there, just to give you an idea, we are, uh, you need to understand for those who don't know that the Skultech is masters and PhD only. It was designed to be a small university from the start with 1,200 students maximum and 200 faculty members. So very specialized, trying to avoid to have departments to provide flexibility. And so now we've at 218 and this year we had more than 400 graduates, mainly masters of course, but the PhDs are coming in and attracted funding in terms of grants and contracts, but mainly contracts, industrial contracts, which is large. If you look at the co-authored publications, in fact, with, you know what's amazing is that we realize that we've, our faculty, which is 140 now, have written uh, publications with 800 institutions in the world. The reason it's, it's very simple is that if you recruit international faculty that have their own network, well, it multiplies. 
So we have 208 publications with North America, 500 with Europe, and then 142 with Asia, most, mostly China. And we have some partners here which are in different fields, and you'll see that we are quite uh, focused. So the importance of publication here, I just want to give you a, a brief over, overview of prominence, which is hot topics in which we're involved in. And of course, from the beginning, since Coltec had to be small and uh, uh, to perform, uh, the areas of uh, selected uh, were to be in the prominence. So you the biggest one which you can see here is bio and the CRISPR research with NIH and so on, it has been a strong part. And here you have materials, photonics, and AI, and some engineering energy here related. All right, so this, these are the very focused areas of, of uh, research uh, at Skoltech and teaching. If you look at the citation impact, if we look at bibliometrics, of course, it's very good even after eight years it's uh, almost eight years it's it's very very strong because we recruit faculty based on those criteria and uh, this is the uh, thing of course you know we can maybe look a little bit like MIT as much higher than us and much higher than us but we are really competing on on some very strong foot but limited in scope right you have to find here that these are the only areas where we are, okay? So highly selective. If you look at the, uh, the now, Skoltech was created on a collaboration basis, like I said, very much on complementarity. Can we see that we were complementary to MIT at the beginning? I would say no, because, well, we were non-existent from the beginning, right? And therefore, it was Big Brother that's uh, bringing us forward. Uh, we have uh, domains, of course, Center for Data Intensive Science and Engineering, very strong uh, IT and data science. This is the largest one, Life Sciences and Health, and we have a new one there, Neurobiology and Brain Restoration, and we have Agriculture joining now, and we have cutting edge advanced engineering, design manufacturing space, and hydrocarbon recovery, which I'll talk a little later, which is so important for Russia. And then energy storage, energy science and technology, smart grids, photonics, and quantum materials, and advanced studies, which is mathematics and physics, really pure mathematics. Now, there is this box here at the beginning, which is a Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation. Today, as you know, we, I was hearing it a lot yesterday that you cannot have a university without having some focus on innovation, how you, entrepreneurship and innovation, and this is extremely important, and this is touching all, and this is something that we are working very intensely. Just to give you a quick, we are 140 faculty aiming to be 200 by 2023, 2024. Uh, most from Russia, but diaspora, USA, UK, and many other countries uh, in terms of faculty members. The Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation is a very, very important collaborative part. And in fact, this is where complementarity, internal complementarity, because I think that Complementarity is not only for international collaboration. I think it has to do with internal, okay? In fact, if we look at global engagement, academic engagement, which is a very important thing for universities these days, the Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation is difficult to put in a, any academic setting because it, it's kind of traversing all fields and therefore, it's uh, not easy to find its place. And if you look at MIT, and if you look at any of the top universities, I think we still have some ways to go to integrate this. But from the beginning, with MIT's help, we've, we founded the CEI, what we call CEI, the Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation, to instill a culture of innovation. The goal of CEI is commercialized also 
So it is a teaching and technology transfer, all in one. And, and also trying to do cutting edge research entrepreneurship, but mainly education, innovation assistance, mentoring, catalyst program, workshops and events, EI workshops and events, and knowledge transfer office, and translational research innovation program, where our students and faculty can apply to get some startups going. I think that one of the, I'm not gonna talk much about it, but one of the particularities that we have, and that was developed in collaboration with MIT, which I think is very important, is all our master's students, 300 of them, the first day they arrive, they spend one month full-time in innovation boot camp. We take them from their science background, strong science background or engineering, and we put them in a series of exercises to, to break the mold of pure science or pure engineering to see you can do something else. You can learn to build an idea, you can learn to pitch it, to present it to commercially, to people, and therefore you can do something else, all right? So three and a half weeks, they start 1st of September, and they finish around the 27, 28, and they learn how to be good in something they don't know about, and how to work in teams, how to uh, be uh, mentored by experienced people, and so on. So this is called the Innovation Workshop. The first version of it was done with 20 students at MIT, and now it's done with 300. So the challenge is to do, make it work with 300, all right? In one, in one very intense. And from there, then you go, the students go to their normal programs. But they have this intense infusion of innovation. And I think that, to me, the intensity is something that's very important. And active learning, yesterday, and I totally agree, that learning has to be active. And therefore, we do have an independent study period, which we, in January, like they have at MIT, where we have students presenting their own courses, uh, faculty also short courses to teach different things. And you have the innovation workshop, which you have, which you can call it, it's a boot camp. And that could be, uh, and then you have some students there learning to do some biology, even though they could be from physics, all right? So, and everybody goes to the fab lab and learns how to make things. Education, just very quickly, we are about 1,000 students now, 600 masters, 400 PhD with 32%. We used to be 38% female, now we are 32, but this is the good ratio. 16 to 20% international students and 140 and 200 courses. So a lot, a fair amount of courses and uh, laboratories where students can learn. Of course, uh, this comes also with a phenomenal campus which we're just moving in. You, you see this picture here, this is 140,000 square meters. This is a big facility, it was designed by Herzog de Muron it just won the UNESCO University Campus Prize. You see that this is the offices and two inner rings and the laboratories are these. And this is the, what you see here is this inner yard here, all right? This is the inside of, and this is uh, one lab here and this is one of the inner rings. We've moved there in offices and classrooms. We have a student court space and library which is being delivered and we started to move research and teaching laboratories and this is a huge challenge for the next two years is because now we, we've built 27 research and teaching laboratory in our temporary building and we're moving to this facility now in the next two years. Now, if you look at research, of course, it's easier to start with similarity, but you learn the results of synergy on complementarity are higher. But the 
evidence shows, the research evidence shows that the existence of complementary resources is a necessary but insufficient condition to achieve synergy. So just to come back, the complementarity approach will provide higher results, but it needs to be fed properly, effectively integrated and managed to realize synergy. And that's from the same paper. I'm bringing that because Skultec is developed in a very peculiar uh, environment, which is the one of the Skokovo Innovation Center. We are a player in this. See the campus that I showed you is this. This is our campus. We used to be a temporary campus is here, in the building three here. And now you have Renova Lab, you have corporate laboratories, you have the new Sberbank R&D Center, which will have 12,000 people working in there. And then there is spaces for startups, us, residential. So it's real city with residential. There is a gymnasium, preschool and school up to high school. And this is the space for startups. So it's a whole city right in the suburb of Moscow. So we are a player. Now, complementarity is obviously there because you have startups here, and therefore we could say that we could, and you have large companies, but to make it work, and this is my experience in Canada, it requires some very careful management. It requires some very thoughtful process ideas and people, people that, can, that really believe into it and can make it work. If you look at the Skull Taxi, we're here. We have links with international universities. We have very, good, we recruit very good students, and we have technology cooperation, collaborations, and then we have industrial companies, participants of the techno park. The city of Moscow is involved, and venture funds. But it doesn't mean that automatically it works well. I think the what, what I'm starting to realize as a university, and I've been a university professor all my life, is that, you know, the university, we have a tendency to be in uh, what we people call us to be in the ivory tower, okay? And we are doing very well there. Generally, we, we do good research, we can, but then how well can we collaborate with all those people is still something to be developed. And I think that this is a challenge for us and there is so much to leverage for the future there because international collaboration is not only for us to do, but also for all the startups and the larger companies to, to work with. If you look at our startups, <coughs> we are in 218 in uh, these are internal to Skultec, 17 and 26 are SK residents. I mean, they are now accepted within the Skolkovo Innovation Center and have support over there, but they're still Skultec companies. Now, I, I think this collaboration is not perfect. I think that this is something that still needs to be done and it's a perfection, but we are really, really moving and I think that this innovation, and I, I don't have a lot of time to talk to you about the um, curriculum and how we, but you, I've talked to you about the innovation workshop. I think this intense, very intense initial impulse has a determining impact on students to say, well, maybe I can start something. Research facilities, of course, uh, you, you know, you need to be uh, active learning. You need to learn from doing things. Uh, yesterday, we talked about social sciences, and you need to be in the, in the, on the streets and learn from the streets and the art. Well, in science and engineering, you need laboratories to work, and, and you need students to go in companies. But this is something that still we could talk much more about. Let's talk to you about one of those, I think one of the best example of complementarity is the one that the laboratory of uh, um, energy or oil recovery. This is the, the facility here, and it was developed in collaboration with the University of Calgary. Professor Raj Mehta here 
is key to this. They've, and then we have Professor Sherry Mitzin from Skoltech. These two guys made it happen. And there is a, a, a it's all about deep uh, uh, recovery there and difficult to recovery oil. And so the complementarity there is that University of Calgary had developed this technology for research in deep drilling and, and uh, uh, simulation of extraction deep on the, the ground. And then we, are, we were looking for solutions to, to implement it. And this was the phenomenal collaboration which is still ongoing. If you look at it, what have we done? I think that we've done graduate student exchange, joint courses to a certain extent, and faculty. Now, we have researchers and laboratories, Skoltech and Calgary, which are complementary, but still need research infrastructure capacity building. But now, I think we need to develop joint PhD, joint research project and new enterprises in Russia and Canada. I think that these guys are the key. So I think that this is something that I want to mention, which is the big difference from the business perspective. So differences to take into account is that universities are not companies. I'm not trying to tell you here that universities are companies. I'm trying to tell you that we can adapt what they've learned and collaborations most often are from bottom up, okay? And if we sign MOU to make them live, to me, we absolutely need concrete projects and faculty members, researchers who are involved from the beginning. So this is a big difference. It's not a top-down, most of the time, top-down thing. And we need to absolutely remember that our goal is not to make money, it's to educate students, right? which will be responsible, competent, and open contributors to the world. This is our most important. And this is the highest value that we can bring, and these are our most important ambassadors. And one very important goal of university international collaboration, to me, is world peace. Because I think that if we have people talking to each other, exchanging ideas, like I saw here, and QS is certainly one organization which is promoting this, I think that this is for the better of the world and this is extremely important for the future of our planet. And I think that it's only when we have world peace that we can hope to develop a fruitful, sustainable future for our planet. I think it has to start there and I think that the more universities manage to develop deeper collaboration. And I urge you to look at the complementarity approach like we will, like we are doing, like we would like to do more, that we will develop very, very meaningful collaborations for the future. So thank you very much. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you.